I would like to start the panel titled Human Rights and Hate Speech Legal Perspectives. Let me introduce the chair who has been working in the field of human rights uh, and practice center in Istanbul Big University since 2005. He is a researcher. He has worked on the freedom of assembly, individual uh, right to individual application to European Court of Human Rights and human rights in general. Still, he works as a member of faculty uh, working in the field of constitutional law. Gulash Karan is our moderator in this panel. Welcome. Thank you for the invitation. In 2010, when you had the first conference, I was presenting for the first time uh, for this good audience, and we introduced a, a book. Uh, the book was about the hate speech, and that was, I think, for a long time, one of the most comprehensive publications. And I always referred to your publications during uh, carrying out when I'm carrying out my own research. So it's a great pleasure to see uh, the organization of this conference. After a while, I see very prominent figures in the uh, in various panels. I wish we were face to face. We could meet with lots of friends, familiar faces and new faces. So this is a virtual event, obviously. This is about human rights and hate speech with legal perspectives. We were uh, going to have three speakers, but one of the speakers couldn't make it. So we had to move that speaker to another panel. We ended up having two speakers, Hakan Ottoman, is one of our speakers. He is very active in the field of civil society. I know him personally. He has been working uh, in the field of working against discrimination and uh, he has a lot to contribute. The second speaker is a lawyer, Tuche Duygu Köksal. I have known her for a long time. She has been active as a lawyer in the field of human rights. She is an activist at the same time. And Istanbul Bar Association Human Rights Center is chaired by her. And they just published a very good report relating to the data from 2018 and 19. And uh, that is a significant contribution on the part of the Bar Association. So basically, I have those two speakers. They will deal with uh, the differences between hate speech and discrimination, the political discourse, the role played by the human rights law in the field of fighting against discrimination. These questions will be handled. But I want to hand the microphone over to Hakan in the first place. He will be the first speaker. He has uh, 15 minutes. He will introduce technical details. And please type your questions uh, in the chat box. We're happy to get your questions. They will be hopefully answered after the presentations. We would be happy to address the questions. Our technical team uh, will be collecting the questions and sharing them with me. I want to turn to Hakan. It's over to you. Thank you very much, Ulaş. Yes, we may have the chance to have, have a talk with you uh, and uh, other participants if we had the chance to have a physical meeting because it's been a while I had to, I had last met you. Good morning. I have been following the uh, panel sessions so far. And during this session, I will tell you more about what's happening in the field. What is my take as a human rights activist and as a researcher about what is happening on the ground? But first of all, I would like to also touch upon the, the debates as well as the researchers, researchers in this area. So today I will talk about populism, radical right, far right and extreme right. So many authors, many researchers for, for many years have long uh, debated about authoritarianism. Uh, Richard Hofstadt 
once said, everyone talks about populism, but no one is able to define what populism is. Previously, London School of Economics held a series of uh, seminars where uh, the, the scholar also uh, attended and uh, uttered these words. So as we make the effort to define populism, uh, there are different uh, resources are being used and there are different choices are made. So I would like to talk about those. In fact, the definitions or the words used for defining populism is in fact very much overlapping with the words we use for defining discrimination and the discourse, actions, and the uh, manifesto of most of the political parties. Well, by the way, Trump lost the election and the post-Trump US uh, will, will unfold and we will see all together uh, how it unfolds. But we know that the, the, the Trump era is also uh, falling within this definition that was uh, a period where we have seen an uh, extreme aversions of uh, populism and radicalism. Nowadays, we are also faced with some discriminatory practices, racist practices. And there are also some uh, scholars who criticize that instead of racist or discriminatory, the word neo-fascist should be used, especially Bolsonaro, Bolsonaro uh, the, the president of Brazil. So when we take leaders like him into account, then maybe we should uh, really uh, not be able to resist this uh, criticism. If you allow me, I would like to show some slides. It will help me also uh, keep an eye on my time. There are a number of researchers, primarily Kasmuc, uh, they define the different waves or fluctuations of populism and they uh, look into that under four categories. The first one is neo-fascism and this includes neo-fascist parties right after the Second World War in the recovery process and the second wave is the right wing uh, populism which took place between 1955 and 1980 and uh, which uh, was against the idea of welfare state. The third wave was the uh, new or neo-radical uh, uh, right that covered 1980 and, and 2000, uh, which uh, we have uh, observed in, in, in different countries. And the fourth one is the era that started in 2000 and we see in, in different countries around the world. So we can see a modest and moralist political uh, tendency. That's what we are faced with. Uh, by the way, I have included a number of uh, utterances or, or expressions. The first one uh, from the Nazi state, uh, one nation, one empire, one leader. And uh, from the Franco era, the motto was one great and free. Likewise, we can look into the uh, Trump uh, election campaign in, in 2016, uh, which read as one people under one God saluting one flag. And we know that Recep Tayyip Erdogan uh, used uh, one nation, one flag, one homeland, one state uh, motto. And again, uh, Jair Bolsonaro, the president of Brazil uh, once stated that he rather uh, sees his son die in a traffic accident rather than uh, being a homosexual. And Le Pen once talked about uh, dual citizenship and she said that it, they have to make a choice. They are either Algerian or, or French, Moroccan or French. They cannot be both of them at the same time. 
So since we have uh, time constraints, uh, I want to only share with you those examples. When Kasmut defined populist radical uh, right wing, uh, he made use of 23 subcategories. I will not mention each and every one of them, but we can see xenophobia standing out, racism, anti-migration, and many other concepts stand out in the definition of Kasmut of populist radical right. And we can, we in fact uh, define all these categories as discrimination in international human rights uh, documents. And I will soon share a table with you, which will illustrate uh, the terminology we use, but in fact, populism by itself offers such a fertile ground uh, for human rights violations. We do not define populism as such, uh, as a violation of human rights, as an outright violation of uh, human rights. However, populism itself offers the most fertile ground and the most enabling environment uh, for uh, violating human rights. We should not limit ourselves to the classification made by Kasmut. Today, we are also faced with uh, sexism and uh, in intolerance, religious intolerance, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, homophobia, chauvinism, economic and social uh, origins, authoritarianism, anti-democracy and militarism. So these are the other concepts we can add into this uh, definition. So we can in fact end up with uh, more than 30 uh, subcategories, which can easily create a terminological chaos. But why are we dealing with all these different concepts or terms? Why do we bother to do that? It's important for human rights defenders, human rights activists to understand these terms in order to be able to devise a strategy, in order to understand our own uh, activist movement and to organize ourselves because we need to know what we are faced with. That's the reason why uh, I personally would like to uh, focus on all those uh, terms and concepts. There are international human rights conventions and documents. And these documents uh, include various definitions, but we also need to talk about uh, an attack that we are faced at the moment. Uh, we are faced with such an attack that, in fact, uh, spans over a large swathe of areas. As we do all these conceptualization, political uh, theorists tend to focus on water behaviors, political parties, manifestos, their discourse, their their votes, the, the, the vote turnouts. But on the other hand, the human rights movement has other concerns to human rights activists. Do not really focus on what the manifesto of a political party should be or what their discourse should be. Human rights activists rather focus on the actions, the acts of political parties and their implications on human rights. So, Kasmut made his own uh, categorization or, or definition in order to make all these uh, concepts uh, clear for us. But there are some other uh, schools of thoughts. One is that uh, family resemblance uh, theory, but according to uh, 
Kasmod, this is not exactly the method that we can use, but there are also other uh, academics who worked on the issue, such as Umberto Eco, who defined uh, 14 uh, features of eternal fascism. And he also uh, used the uh, Wittgenstein uh, family resemblance theory as well. So, uh, the in, in, in eternal uh, fascism, uh, Umberto Eco talks about a number of uh, concepts that I have already shared in, in my screen, uh, including the new speak and irrationalism. But the f fear of difference, new speak, and anti pacifism stands out in Umberto Eco's theory. Likewise, Lawrence Britt has also worked on this issue. And he talks about uh, nepotism, and he talks about elections, and he talks about the, the supremacy or, or uh, praise of monetarism. So these concepts are also equally important for us. There is another concept of ideal type, but it is also being criticized for having its own shortcomings. This is also used in, in Müller's, uh, Jean Weiner Müller's uh, representative uh, democracy. But this is also very much linked with uh, monicism because then uh, there is only one representative who claims that they are the only representative and everything can change through referendums. By the way, this is quite a problematic issue uh, for us, uh, for the legal experts. You can just uh, find yourself out overnight uh, that uh, we can, through a referendum, uh, withdraw from all the human rights conventions we have uh, signed. And this may happen overnight in a referendum. Oppressive and exclusionary policies, threats to liberal democracies, seemingly having uh, democracy, but in fact not having it. So these are the concepts that uh, I wanted to ponder upon. These, there, some of them are maximal definitions and some of them are minimal definitions. So now that we have all these definitions, what do we do? What is our task? There is a struggle that takes place since 2007. A number of counter strategies have been devised. But while devising these strategies, it is quite important for us not to not to fall in the trap of polarization, and we should continue listening to one another and understanding one another, because there is this in in intolerance people attack other groups. And you know that during the, the COVID era, there was a person who went to an Armenian church in Istanbul and took off the cross. In, in my own personal uh, media watch, I can uh, see uh, a great number of uh, lynching or mobbing instances. We know the racist attacks in the US, the George Floyd case. So we should not really fall into this trap and act accordingly. Law, of course, is a very important means for us. In, in Greece, the Golden Dawn Party was shut down. Likewise, in, in Germany, a number of right-wing movements were also banned. Right after the executive order of Trump, American civil rights movement or union uh, made uh, a statement and some of the migrants who were arrested earlier on uh, were released. As the Council of Europe has recently indicated in, in Poland, in, in Hungary, and also in, in, in the case of Osman Kavala, 
we know that the law can also be used uh, for another purpose. So by means of making use of law or exploiting law, the law can easily stand against us, against human rights activists, against migrants we can see that in Italy, in, in Hungary, in the US, we can see the activities of uh, migrant support organizations are being banned in those countries. So if you need to support migrants, you need to first uh, obtain permission from the ministry. So law, in fact, it works against us. Therefore, the law, the rule of law itself is very important for us. We need to definitely uh, watch out for the elections. We should care for the conduct of the elections. We have seen its importance during the most recent elections in the US. But watching over elections by itself is not really enough by itself. As the 20 lessons from the 20th century, this may be the very last resort. Uh, that there may be this may be the very last resort. So still, it will be important for us to uh, to go to the ballot box and cast our vote. By the way, perhaps in Putin's Russia, in China, or in Azerbaijan, uh, there is there may be um, an authoritarianism and therefore elections may not be really meaningful in those countries. However, uh, the local elections in Turkey and the elections in the US uh, once again prove that the elections are important. Especially in countries where anti-migrant movements are on the rise, we can see uh, the Democrats or Greens are joining their forces and they're able to stop uh, these uh, anti-migrant uh, sentiments. Women's movement is another important uh, movement that we should ponder upon uh, when it comes to uh, global solidarity and advocacy. There are examples uh, at the global level, but also in, in Turkey, there was uh, a debate uh, around uh, Turkey's withdrawal from the Istanbul Convention, but the women's rights groups, they, they started a campaign under the motto of Istanbul Convention saves lives. And they waged a very significant struggle against the sexist discourse as well. And this was quite an influential campaign. Even Recep Tayyip Erdogan, the president of Turkey, including himself, he's not talking about withdrawing from Istanbul Convention any longer. And Las Tizis, a movement that started in Chile, uh, quickly spread to other parts of the world. We should also keep that in mind. In the US, uh, protests outbroke after the killing of George Floyd, which still continue. And there are some international movements, refugee welcome movements. And once again, the George Floyd protests, I would like to mention that uh, that turned into a civic movement it's by itself. At the same time, uh, the struggle is going on in the political sphere. Uh, Friedrich Norman Foundation, which is also one of the supporters of this conference, is also part of this uh, struggle movement. But that also includes uh, uh, Friedrich Ebert and uh, Konrad Adenauer. Uh, and we know that racism is strong in Germany, but anti-racist movements are equally strong in, in, in Germany. Heinrich Böll is yet another important uh, foundation that uh, struggles against uh, these problems. Targeted monitoring and reporting will be very important against this backdrop. And Civicus 
Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch uh, are among the international civil society organizations. Last but not least, I would like to talk about the social media. Open Global Rights is an organization that works on counter-racist discourse or counter-racist movements. So it compiles together. And in Turkey, we have a Kratane Istanbul uh, Literature House uh, also launched a number of uh, talks, uh, a number of uh, talk series under Happy One Who Says I'm Equal. I have listened to the most recent uh, press conference of the Secretary General of WHO. He said, even if we find COVID-19 vaccine, there is no vaccine for poverty, for racism, for climate change. So uh, we, these are the real issues that we should work on. So that's why I think it will be very important to work on economic and social rights. This is something that the mainstream human rights movement has neglected for such a long time. For instance, when there is unemployment, it's always very convenient to put the blame on migrants. Or when poverty uh, is being debated, it is always easy to put the blame on welfare issues. But then there are for instance, health services that are not provided effectively. Or whenever we talk about the networks in solidarity with the uh, impoverished, the elitists can easily attack those movements. And uh, these are, of course, backed by political uh, movements as well. So we should uh, find a way uh, to counter uh, these uh, political discourse uh, that runs against the human rights movements and human rights uh, discourse. We should uh, make it insignificant somehow. And the civil society should once again refocus on economic and social rights, and that will take uh, quite some organizing on our part. Meanwhile, the, the radical uh, far right, the populist right, uh, will continue to attack us as human rights activists, and we should uh, try to uh, counter that uh, and, and make that insignificant or meaningless. That was a long one. So let me stop here. If you have questions, I'll do my best to respond to them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hakan Ataman. We are running out of time, but I think we will make up for the uh, time. We had a good conceptual discussion and uh, personally, it's due to my heart too. That's very interesting. You explained populism in different ways. That was very interesting. You also talked about alt-right, alternative right. That could also be looked at. That concept is also interesting. Fascism experience back in 1930s is a little bit similar also to what we're having today, but populist discourses and manifest themselves in different forms and shapes. It's important to uh, identify all of them. And this was such a rich content. Hakan Ataman, thank you. Now it's over to Tuğçe Duygu Töksal. She will talk about uh, the sharp difference between hate speech and defamatory speech and the positive obligation of the public authorities to investigate hate speech. Hello, distinguished participants. I found the previous speech very, very rich in its content, and the previous speaker will also shape my presentation, and I learned a lot from the previous speaker. We know in the field of uh, discrimination, 
Uh, I also learned a lot from Ulaş Karan. It's an honor to be a speaker in a panel moderated by Ulaş. Well, we have listened to the previous speaker who talked about populist uh, political discourse. He talked about far-right extremism. And following on from where he left off, I'd like to introduce a legal perspective about this issue. The speaker referred to the elections, legal practices, Democracy and Human Rights Office of European Economic Development Organization. I'd like to refer to their report, and I would like to give you a little bit of information about Turkish practices, the findings of the Court of Constitution of Turkey, European Court of Human Rights, and what it says about positive obligations and how it handles hate speech and freedom of expression. That is the outline of my presentation. And, uh, for the conclusion, I want to turn to Rabat Action Plan of the United Nations. That will be the end of my presentation. Let me start. European Security and Cooperation Organization has a hate uh, crime report, which is publicly accessible from their official website. There are 39 participatory states uh, who provided official data uh, in the report along with the data provided by the civil society organizations. The data refers to 45 uh, countries in total. I will refer to the data presented in the report because that is very much linked to my presentation. OSCE hate crime report evaluations refer to xenophobia, prejudice as the four, uh, most important cause among the 45 countries. Antisemitism ranks the second place. Sexual uh, prejudice-based discourses and crimes come in the third place. Then against Christians, Muslims, Roma people, and against sex, sex and against disabled people. So these are different categories of discrimination and hate speech. How about Turkey? According to the data presented to OSC officially, by the way, this was in cooperation with the police academy and the national security forces, there is no classification based on prejudices. In total, there are 79 different kinds of crimes officially recorded in this field. However, thanks to the contribution of civil society organizations, we see the number is actually larger than 79. It's about 80. There's no categorization in Turkey's official data. However, the NGO-based data gives us some ideas. A hate crime report of OECD introduces racism, xenophobia, anti-Semitism, and sexual orientation in the first three places. But in Turkey, sexual orientation and prejudices against sexual identity. In the second place, xenophobia, uh, including, of course, the migrants. And in the third place, prejudice against Muslims. This is the categorization in Turkey. It, it's a little bit different in Turkey than most of the other countries. This shows us every country has their own conditions in terms of what kind of prejudices display themselves in each respective country. Let's take a look at the system in Turkey. Hate crime, discrimination, is that, are they seen as a crime? Turkish Penal Code, Article 122. It's described as a crime, exactly, in the Turkish Penal Code, Article 122. But according to another report, referring to this 122 article, it's not uh, being implemented in real life. Oh, thank you very much. Now you can see my PowerPoint presentation. Yes, this was the report I was introducing a minute ago. Can you go to the next slide? Yes. Let's stay here. I was saying Article 122, it's not being implemented very much. And there is a need to amend this article. 
there are recommendations made by the Council of Europe, the UN Special Rapporteurs and OSCE suggests Turkey to amend Article 122 because discrimination grounds in this article are very limited and they are valid only in certain categories, so it doesn't cover some other categories. So the scope is limited, unfortunately. And this unfortunately gives rise to a certain number of discrimination-based crimes, hate uh, speech-based crimes, as it is. We also have 125, Article 125, third paragraph, and paragraph, uh, subparagraph B refers a little bit to prejudice-based uh, crimes, hate crimes, but if the scope is still limited, religious, political, social, philosophical, thoughts, opinions, the article says. The scope is limited in terms of how it describes insults or discrimination basis. We have another article, which is Article 216, the crime to incite uh, people to violence. It has three important paragraphs, social class, religion, sect, regional differences that are described as basis. The second paragraph refers to social status, religious, sex. Yes, here they refer to sex. And this refers to openly insulting based on religion, sex, and other categories. But there is a criterion here. I want to draw your attention to that criterion. Public order, a threat to public order, inciting people to uh, violence. So there is this criterion. Now I want to turn to the case law of the European Court of Human Rights. Then, when I introduce that, you will understand why I emphasize this criterion. By the way, what you're looking at at the moment is the decision of the Constitutional Court of Turkey. What I'd like to emphasize is we have a Turkish human rights and equality institution. And this institution is acting as the protect a prevention mechanism vis-a-vis -vis the UN and they uh, receive complaints, that's true, that's a complaint mechanism, but this institution in its founding law doesn't specifically, uh, it specifically describes under which conditions it is going to handle complaints. So the scope is limited and this is done on purpose in the establishing law of this institution. So this institution handles those complaints filed only within a certain scope. So both in Turkish penal code and in the establishing law of Turkish uh, human rights and equality institution, we absolutely need to make amendments to make the scope uh, more comprehensive. Now I can turn to the ruling of the constitutional court. In 2014, uh, the decision number 12,225. So there, according to this, there is this applicant, you can read it yourself, and it's about hate speech. And this paragraph says there is no clear definition of hate speech. And that's true. That's exactly true. We don't have a specific definition of hate speech in any of the rulings or court decisions or documents. The constitutional course emphasizes the non-existence of that description and they refer to a classification of hate speech. This crime manifests itself in different ways like populist discourse, political discourse. It's not a tangible thing to describe per se. It is very, it might be hard to discern the, the differences. But the court clearly says one thing. By the way, the rulings of this court is binding, of course, on all public agencies, any agency. So they refer to a crime based on intolerance, hate speech based on intolerance. They refer to this phrase. And Gündüz Türkiye and Erbakan Türkiye 
ECHR rulings are referred to in the decision of the Constitutional Court on all basis of discrimination, all any kind of basis for discrimination are uh, referred to here in this paragraph. It could be gender, sexual identity, sexual orientation, disability, being disadvantaged. Any hate speech against these groups is described as intolerance and should be punished as a, a crime. Let's turn to, uh, I should say, let's refer to Gündüz Erbakan decisions and how ECHR frames hate speech and what is it all about positive obligations within the context of hate speech. Well, most of you should know about famous rulings. Handicide ruling, it's very popular. Handicide judgment of the ECHR. Could you move to the next slide, please? Yes, I want to talk about the handicide uh, judgment. I'm not going to give you lots of details. Just I want to refer to the name of the uh, judgments. And that you see a list of judgments. This judgment is referring to the concept of offending, shocking and disturbing information. It is there is a protection within the scope of ex freedom of expression. How about Erbakan Türkiye? Paragraph 56 says, quote and quote, speech based on hate is the basis for the application, and this is, speech is made by a politician. In principle, it says in democratic societies, there can be some limitations on the freedom of expression based on some legal conditions, um, as long as they're proportionate and legitimate. However, incitement to hatred, legit anything that legitimizes hatred should be punished and should be prevented, unquote. This is a very important emphasis. Constitutional court also used this emphasis. And you know about Gündüz case. This is the first time an application was, uh, this is the first time uh, when the court emphasized the necessary protection was not made. Erbakan ruling followed after this. We heard about populist, far-right extremist discourses, anti-Semitism introduced by the previous speaker. There are different kinds. And the uh, there was a big pile of files in front of the ECHR uh, judges, especially during the elections, far-right politicians, discourses, discourses against foreigners. Let's look at Fere Belgium ruling. In Belgium, this happens very frequently. Also in the UK, very frequent cases vis-à-vis -vis the ECHR. In the Belgium case, uh, the incident happened during the election period against the foreigners, but the court ruled that it was not a violation. The politicians use uh, some extremist discourses. And the court ruled that freedom of expression was not violated in this example. Apart from this, hate speech, in to what extent one incident is hate speech, to what extent it is a right that should be protected within the scope of freedom of expression. So we need to discern. In that, uh, I should say, the ECHR follows two approaches. In the first approach, either the court identifies there is hate speech, and when they identify it's hate speech, they consider that as a violation or abuse of right under Article 17. And it takes it out of the scope of the freedom of expression and it considers it as inadmiss inadmissible. Extreme discourses reaching uh, the level of hate speech. So some discourses uh, reach the threshold of hate speech and some do not, according to their uh, descri uh, the description. 
By the way, the court doesn't provide any categorization or a specific definition. Like in these, in these cases, it's a hate speech. In that case, it's not a hate speech. So no such clear description. How about uh, the speeches made by the politicians, populist speeches? For example, in France, there was an important example, a politician who said, we have 5 million foreigners who, whose numbers will go up to 25 million and they will start to move then. Le Pen made that statement and under Article 17, the court uh, didn't accept that under the, the, the scope of protection of freedom of expression. There's another political example in France. Some politicians uh, frequently uh, use such discourse against foreigners. They blame the foreigners. For example, if there is an increase in the rates of crimes, those politicians think it's because of the foreigners and they utter this in their speeches. The court refers to Article 17 in those cases. There's another French case, Embala, Embala versus France. This is an important case. We have examples in Turkey too. During artistic expression of opinions, for example, they refer to incitement of people to violence. Embala is such an example that regards anti-Semitism, a negationist discourse. The artist during the stand-up show is making a speech on stage and a, a, a member of academia who negates uh, the Holocaust is awarded, so a negationist approach is adopted. So coming to the more recent period, in May there is an island decision this year, May, this is about sexual orientation, Lillian Dahl Island case. This is about LGBT community, insults and hate speech against an LGBT community. So uh, this is about online posts and comments. So such content is considered as a violation of the freedom of expression. Could you wrap up, please? Sure, sure. So that was going to be my conclusion sentence. Could you move to the next slide, please? ECHR doesn't clearly describe what is a hate speech, what is not a hate speech. But the court introduces a threshold. Or they introduce a weight in order to decide whether something can be considered as hate speech or not. If they think the incident reaches that threshold, they impose sanctions or uh, punishment. And then they decide that it is a violation. One other thing I'd like to say, Russia decision, February 2020, this ruling concerns non-Russians, non-Russian people who are depicted as uh, criminals. That is the subject of the case. And ECHR found that this uh, discourse is not a violation. Effective investigation obligation. I'd like to talk about that. Effective investigation. Dink Turkey, a Turkey decision is the first example here. The positive obligation of government in terms of freedom of expression. Özgür Gündem case is another example, but especially in Dink case. The conviction, there's a conviction decision taken and the 
efficient investigation opportunities were not provided to him and he was depicted as a target for the far right groups. So the positive obligations are tackled here. Vis-a-vis -vis the ECHR, this case is a very important one, not just regarding the freedom of expression, of course. It's beyond that. November 2020, Ukraine decision is a very recent example. Please uh, go ahead and refer to this case if that is interesting to you. For example, Yehovah witnesses for religion-based sex, ba sexual identity-based crimes are supposed to be properly described by the states. In this Ukraine decision, dated November 2020, hooliganism or hate speech is not properly described but they are described as simple insult or simple injury. This is used as the basis for trial, and the ECHR thinks this is problematic. Lastly, I should say there is a Georgia decision, October 2020. This is about sexual orientation, crimes based on sexual orientation. In this case, police enters for search purposes into a, an LGBT community, and this is a, a violation of the rule of effective investigation. There is Shakir Greece case. It is also similar. This is about uh, crimes committed on, uh, based on hatred and perpetrated either by government agencies or third parties. Last slide, please. I don't want to use more time, but last slide. Delphi decision. Hate speech on internet. For how long hate speech remains on internet imposing um, a fine and it's not considered as a expression of freedom if there is hate speech the echr does not consider that as freedom of expression and they do a proportionality test and in this decision the, the ruling said it cannot be considered within the scope of the freedom of expression I want to talk about the UN here. I'd like to make this robot action plan more visible. It deserves to be more visible. As I said, we don't have a clear definition of this concept. The ECHR refers to intolerance, intolerant uh, discourse, and the court ruling says it's, it's a punishable crime. Civil Political Rights Convention Article 20 of the UN provides a narrow sense of description of hate speech, saying it should be punished, but the scope is narrow. That is why uh, the UN came up with Robot Action Plan, and they introduced a threshold test. Please take a look at this at a convenient time. Basically, what it says is, in order to identify whether something is hate speech, there should be a threshold test conducted. Our Article 216 also talks about this. You need to check the context, the author, the intention of the author, the content of what author said, what is the scope of the utterance, and what is the incentive. Is there any threat like inc incitement of violence? which poses a threat to public security, public order. So this is the threshold test. We can refer to this as open and imminent threat. 
I would like to leave you with this idea. Please take a look at this uh, action plan, robot action plan later on. The UN doesn't uh, have a clear description of hate speech either, but at least the UN introduced a threshold. We will see how it's practiced. Uh, thank you very much.